You're listening to FOJC Radio, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and teaching the doctrine of Christ to the whole world. Good evening and welcome to Friday Night FOJC Remnant Gathering. Grab your Bible and your pens and your paper, and when two or three are gathered in His name, the Lord is right here with us. So thank you for joining us, and here's Brother David. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the August 28, 2020 edition of the FOJC Remnant Gathering. I am David Carricone. For the next hour, we're going to be studying the Word of God. As always, we are so honored for all of you that are joining us for the study this evening. Our study for this evening is going to be entitled, Sending Away the Day of Grace. It will be taken from the 10th chapter of the book of Hebrews. Many things to pray about, as always. Um, Christina for healing. Mary Catulli and her family. Carla and her family. They're recovering from the COVID and all doing very well. Want to pray for Rick for healing from severe neuropathy. Sugar for family unity in Christ and honoring and obeying Christ. Um, for all the people in the path of the hurricane, we just want to remember them. And uh, a request here for people to get out of false teachings. And that's easy to do. Just get into the Bible and the doctrine of Christ. And you'll all automatically get out of false teachings. We want to pray for Dayton, for wisdom and strength, that he will find truth. And we want to give a shout out to the doc, a new friend. And uh, it's good to have friends. So a shout out to our new pal. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. And also continue Operation Move. Everything looks on schedule. Just pray that the evil one cannot hinder as he tries to do. But just pray that everything um, goes through smoothly and quickly. And every indication is that it will do just that. So we're very, very thankful. So let's go to the Father in prayer. Father, we just want to thank you once again for the opportunity to preach your word and to lift you up as the great God and Savior that you are. And Father, we want to pray for Christina for healing, both physical and emotional and for Mary Catulli and her family, that you'll just bring them healing and salvation. And Father, we just thank you and ask you to bless her for her faithfulness. We want to pray also for Carla and her family, for her husband Jim, and for Everetta, that there'll just be complete healing from this COVID. And Father, we thank you for the marvelous way you brought them through that. We want to pray for Rick for healing from severe neuropathy. That, Father, in the name of Jesus, you just touch that right now. Just let your healing touch be upon Rick right now in Jesus' name. Father, we lift up sugar to you. We pray for unity in her family. We pray that there will just be an awakening of the whole family for the need to unite around obeying and serving Jesus. We want to pray for all of those, Father, in the path of this hurricane, that you'll just use this as an opportunity to turn people to you and know that uh, we are nothing and that you are everything and to just use it as an occasion to surrender their lives to you. And, Father, we just pray that more and more people will just renounce error and run from it and run to the truth in Jesus' name. And, Father, we we pray for Dayton. We lift him up that you'll just give him the heart to seek after you. And, Father, we just pray in this teaching tonight that you'll just help me to bring it forth in clarity and truth. And we're going to give you the praise for it everything good that happens in jesus name we pray amen and amen worship the lord for a few moments and we will be back with our study for this evening 
sinning away the day of grace. Sorry, because of the YouTube rules, we cannot put my music on this video recording. However, if you want to hear my music, you can listen to us live on Friday nights at 6 p.m. on our radio page. Or you can go to our podcast page and listen to the recordings there. That's FOJCRadio.com. Thank you. God bless. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews, chapter 10 and verse 25. Sinning away the day of grace. And we're going to set the context for this. Context is king. And we want to get the context of this passage and in verse 25 of Hebrews 10 there's the admonition of scripture not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching and this is such an important thing and it's our prayer that very soon and I mean soon that we are going to be able to gather together every Sabbath for worship. We will be able to be in a place where any one of you that will want to come, you'll know where we're going to be every Saturday there with ourselves and John, worshiping God every Sabbath. We're praying, and make that your prayer, that this can happen very, very soon. And I have every reason to believe it will. And in light of all this covid uh, nonsense. Um, there are churches, as you all know, we're supposed to resist the devil and submit ourselves to God, but they're resisting God and submitting themselves to the devil, and they're obeying the government and disobeying God and forsaking to assemble. In John Owen's commentary, and for those of you that don't know, John Owen was one of the 17th century Puritans. He was one of those that rebelled in 1662 when the Church of uh, England was made compulsory for everyone. In By law in England, it was the British 501c3. They were forced to use the Book of Common Prayer and all ordination had to be through the Church of England. John Owen and about 2,000 more Puritans said, see you later. And in his commentary on Hebrews, and this was very real for him because they continued to assemble, and many of them, like uh, John Flavel's father, he died in prison of the plague. John Bunyan spent over 18 years in prison. They were persecuted, and uh, yet... They did not forsake the assembling of themselves together. There's still an oak tree in England. It's called John Bunyan's Oak, where uh, John Bunyan would hold meetings out in the field under an oak tree. But John Owen said this about this text in Hebrews 25. He said, 1025, he says, To see evidently such a day approaching and not to be sedulous and diligent in the duties of divine worship is a token of a backsliding frame tending unto final apostasy. And that is a ringing condemnation to this day and at this hour of the churches that will resist God and submit themselves to the devil. If ever we needed to assemble, it is now. And surely the, the ease with which they disobey God is surely a sign that this is the last apostasy and also a sign of the great need for this teaching. In Hebrews chapter 10, 38, now we're giving you bookends. We're going to give you 10, 25 and 10, 38, and then we're going to exeget the text in the, in the middle of this. And this sets the context in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 38. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Hear the word of the Lord this evening. If any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. 
I want to read from Heinrich Meyer's commentary. I'm going to bring on the great cloud of witnesses to help us in our study. And Heinrich Meyer wrote in the late 1700s and the early 1800s. And he says this about the book of Hebrews. And this will give us context. And until modern times, this was undisputed. And uh, today, there is no book more hated by the Hebrew movement than the book of Hebrews. Many of them openly say they just want it out of the Bible. I mean, it, it's hated. And it's hated because the book of Hebrews shows the Hebrew movement for the cult that it is. And I didn't stutter. Yes, I said it's a cult. Heinrich Meyer, volume 9, page 380. This is what he said. The recipients of the epistle to the Hebrews, on the other hand, all religious connection with Judaism was originally relinquished, and only now had they become involved in peril. And to begin with, the people that the Apostle Paul, and yes, Paul did write Hebrews. There should be no confusion about that. But here in the last days, everything is just confusion and not clarity. But originally, the people that Paul preached to that were comprising the group that he wrote the epistle to the Hebrews to, they completely broke with Judaism. But Dr. Meyer goes on. For that the recipients of the epistle to the Hebrews not only still continued to occupy themselves with the Jewish temple service and sacrificial ritual, but even regarded participation therein as a necessary requirement for the complete expiation of sins certainly underlies the whole argumentation of the epistle as an everywhere reoccurring supposition. The epistle to the Hebrews was occasioned by the danger to which the Christians in Palestine, particularly in Jerusalem, were exposed of renouncing again their faith in Christ and wholly falling back again into Judaism. Now, this is the context of the book of Hebrews and of the study we're going to have, and we have to understand that. We're not talking in these scriptures about somebody that's weak in the faith. We're not even talking about someone that has backslid. We're not just talking about someone that's struggling with sin, but we're talking about people that have renounced Jesus Christ and have gone back into the air of Judaism. This should be clear. If you're affirming Jesus Christ, if you're still saying uh, the blood still saves, this isn't talking to you. But if you are those that are of the millions of those that are playing fast and loose with the Hebrew root movement that love to repeat their little group speak and uh, all their little customs, danger, danger. This is the road to apostasy. Every Passover, we have those. It's like the graduation ceremony into hell that people will announce that they're renouncing Christianity and going back into Judaism. 80% of them, by the admission of the rabbis, are coming right out of the Hebrew root and Messianic. So this is a warning that really, really needs to be heard, and it needs to be taken very seriously. This isn't some some silly game. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. Let's get into our text. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. We'll get a little bit of help with this Greek word. Orton Wiley, in his commentary, said this, The word for sin is harmatomonitan, having sinned, a present participle, which means not a single sin alone. So we're not talking about somebody that just messes up out of passion or even just sins in a, in a bad way. 
he said, going on, he said, but a continuous practice of sin. These words, therefore, can only mean deliberate and determined sinning committed with willful intention and marking a constant decision against light and truth. So we're not talking about someone, and uh, I don't want to in any way minimize the sin of adultery, but we're not talking about someone that just commits adultery once and asks forgiveness. We're talking about someone that persists in a life of adultery or a life of any of those things that are deliberate sin against the will of God. Now, let's get a definition of sin. And this definition of sin is meaningless to much of the evangelical church in America. They believe the law has passed away, so what does this mean to them? I have no idea. But 1 John 3, 4, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. That's what sin is. The law says, don't do this. You do it. You just sinned. That's what it is. And that's pretty straightforward. But as I say, this has become meaningless to the antinomian American church that rejoices in saying that not only um, all of the law, even the Ten Commandments have passed away. They rejoice in it and zealously teach that. Not all, but indeed the majority. In First John chapter 3 and verse 6, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Now, we want to go through these texts, and we want to think about them, because they're very important. We don't want to be confused a bit on what sin is, God's attitude toward it, and what our attitude toward sin should be. I want to read from John Wesley's commentary on 1 John, and he nails it. He said, Whosoever abideth in communion with him by loving faith sinneth not while he so abideth. If you're abiding in Jesus, you're not going to sin. Now, the problem is we can abide in Jesus and we can feel the presence of the Holy Spirit and all of a sudden uh, it doesn't take long before we can have doubt creep back in, you see, and this is the key to not sinning, abiding in Christ, keeping that relationship by faith in Christ and the cross, the cross, the doctrine, and the example of Christ, this is what gives us the victory over sin, and John Gill, that nonconformist Baptist, he says amen to John Wesley, he says this, as the branch in the vine, deriving all light, life, grace, holiness, wisdom, strength, joy, peace, and comfort from Christ, or dwells in him by faith, enjoys communion with him as a fruit of union to him, and stas stands fast in him, sinneth not. It's about relationship. If we are united with Christ by faith and we're feeling the presence of God, the last thing you want to do is sin. There's no way you're going to. The problem is we have to be aware that this is Satan's objective to breach that abiding presence where the life of Christ is flowing into us. He wants to breach that and bring us into a situation to where he can cause us to stray. Now, in 1 John 3 and 8, he that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. And here again, this word means just not a single act of sin, but a habitual life of sin and sinning. This is what really um, is going to send people to hell. You see, the Father isn't upset with you because you're human. He knows you're human. He made you, after all. He knows how weak and frail we are. The book of Hebrews also says that 
uh, he was in all points tempted like as we are, that he understands our weakness and our frailty because he was tempted just like we are. But in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 18, so it's not our humanness that the Father has a problem with, but it's when we set our will against his. When we say, I know you say not to do that, but I'm going to do that anyway, and I'm just going to keep right on doing it. That's when people get in big, big trouble. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 18, We know that whosoever is born again, again sinneth not. And that doesn't mean that you can't sin. That doesn't mean that you don't still have your sinful nature with you. But that means that anyone that is born again, is not going to have a habitually blatant sinful lifestyle. And anybody that you see that is willfully sinning against God as a part of their everyday existence, that person is not a Christian. It doesn't matter what they claim to be, but people that are born again do not have a habitually sinful lifestyle. We know, 1 John 5.18, that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth, toucheth him not. And we can keep ourselves in that abiding relationship with Christ to where the wicked one cannot touch you. Isn't that something? We all fail. We all fall short. But what a good thing it is to know that there is a place where the wicked one cannot touch us when we are abiding in him and the life of Jesus Christ and his spirit is flowing through us. That wicked one cannot touch us. We can go to the secret place of the Most High where we can be hid in a pavilion against tongues where the Father will shelter us under his mighty arms and keep us safe from all attacks of the enemy. What an important thing for us to know here in these last days. And always, always, always remember 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Because what Satan will tell you, he will tell you that, my goodness, you've messed up. And, uh, you know, you're no good. You've blasphemed the Holy Ghost. You're, you know, you've sinned away the day of grace. What he is, is a big liar. And whenever we come with a repentant heart and confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. What a promise. His mercies are new every morning. Over and over, the mercy of God is extended to us. And we're so thankful for our merciful, loving God. Now, to help us understand, we want to try to get into the nuts and bolts of understanding what sin is and what willful sin is. Because so many times people read this text in Hebrews 10 and not long ago, uh, we taught a lesson, I think it was called Final Apostasy, and uh, we dealt from the text in Hebrews chapter 6, two of the strongest warnings in the Word of God. And this is just a strong warning from the Holy Spirit. Don't be messing around. Don't be messing around with truth. When it comes to truth, you better get it from the Bible and the doctrine of Christ. If you're not you're playing fast and loose with something you shouldn't be playing fast and loose with. In, in the book of Psalms, chapter 19, we'll look at verse 12. Who can understand his errors? Now, <laughs> I like that, you know? And have you ever just been living your life and going through the day and you just do or say something stupid, you know? Uh, yeah, and uh, we all have, haven't we? And you just say, how did I do that? You know, and you know, who can understand his errors? It's that fallen nature. And whenever we allow, and, and it'll happen with all of us, whenever that 
abiding presence of Christ isn't flowing that pure blood of Christ and the Holy Spirit into us, we can we can stray so easily, can't we? Cleanse thou me from my secret faults. Now, we all have faults that we don't even know about. They're secret. And a lot of times our faults are much more evident to other people than our own. We all have a capacity not to recognize our own faults and to justify them. And we need to pray to be able to understand our errors and to pray like the psalmist, cleanse thou me from secret faults. In verse 13, keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Now, there's a big difference from an error, a secret fault, and a presumptuous sin. And we're going to look at the presumptuous sin in the Torah and how it was dealt with um, under the law and pretty much just the same way it is now. Um, and a presumptuous sin is something you do when you know God says not to do it and you just make your mind up, you're going to do it anyway. That's a presumptuous sin. Big difference from something that's a secret fault or uh, an error or something that you do just because you're human and um, you get your knickers in a twist. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. And it's very scriptural to say that while sin does remain in a Christian, it does not reign. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Oh boy, listen to the word of God. You see, you can fail, but you cannot be guilty of the great transgression. The great transgression is when you just keep doing what you know God says not to do. That's the great transgression. That's when you sin away the day of grace. And the next verse here in the Psalms, this should be all of our prayers. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Now, Let's go to the book of Numbers, and let's look at the willful, presumptuous sin and how it was dealt with in the covenant of Moses. In Numbers chapter 15, let's begin reading in verse 25. And the priest shall make an atonement for all the congregation of the children of Israel, and it shall be forgiven them, for it is ignorance. And they shall bring their offering, a sacrifice made by fire unto the Lord, for their sin offering before the Lord, for their ignorance. Now, this is such a great verse. It's better than you have any idea, because under the law of Moses, you could be forgiven for something if you did it out of ignorance. And I mean, just look at all the things there is under the the old covenant it was as hard for them to figure out then as it was for us and even harder because they didn't have all of the scriptures before them to read so at least give yourself as much grace now as they had under the law of Moses that when you do something out of ignorance that it's going to be covered in the atonement of Christ in in verse 26, And it shall be forgiven all the congregation of the children of Israel, and the stranger that sojourneth among them, seeing all the people were in ignorance. And I tell you what, there's entire congregations today in America, they're in ignorance. They're in total ignorance. And they, they don't know. They haven't heard. It's one thing when the Word of God comes to you, and then you're accountable. But there are entire assemblies that are absolutely ignorant of so many things that they really need to know about. And I guess that's where we come in, isn't it? In verse 27, 
And if any soul sin through ignorance, then he shall bring a she-goat of the first year for a sin offering, and the priest shall make an atonement for the soul that sinneth ignorantly, when he sinneth by ignorance before the Lord, to make an atonement for him, and it shall be forgiven him. Ye shall have one law for him that sinneth through ignorance, both for him that is born among the children of Israel, and for the stranger that sojourneth among them. But... Now, that's a big word, isn't it? But the soul that doeth ought presumptuously. There's our word again. If you do it through ignorance, that's one thing. But if you know it's wrong and then you insist on doing it, whether he be born in the land or a stranger, the same reproacheth the Lord. And that soul shall be cut off from among his people because he hath despised the word of the Lord and hath broken his commandment that soul shall utterly be cut off his iniquity shall be upon him big difference between a presumptuous sin a secret fault and an error now the sacrifice of Christ gives us forgiveness and we are covered by the intercession of Christ for what we do in ignorance. Now, give yourself just as much grace as they had under the law of Moses. Now, that's when God has a problem with us. He has a problem not because we're human or not because we don't understand something, but he has a problem with us when we do understand it and insist on doing what he says not to do. In Deuteronomy chapter 17 and verses 12 and 13, And the man that will do presumptuously and will not hearken unto the priest, and, and here's a big deal too, you know, it's just not like you, you mess up, you're gone. But you see, when you, when you sin presumptuously, well, you know, then the priest is going to have to have a word with you, see. And that's the way it is under the old and the new. You see, when we see people that are deliberately sinning, blatantly breaking the commandments of God, we're going to have to have a word with them. Because we, we do that because we care for their souls. That's why. And the man that will do presumptuously and will not hearken unto the priest that standeth the minister there before the Lord thy God or unto the judge, even that man shall die. And thou shalt put away the evil from Israel. And I have to clarify, I'm not saying we kill people, but I am saying God will kill you. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Die, Ezekiel 18.4, Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Sin kills. Sin kills. There's two kind of preachers, the ones that say, that believe that sin kills, and the ones that believe says sin doesn't kill. Some preachers believe when a person is born again, sin changes. I'm the kind of preacher that believes when a person is born again, they're going to quit sinning. There's a big difference here, and the difference is one that we don't want to miss because the devil has a field day here. He has a field day with getting people to believe that they can willfully sin and still be right with God, and he also has a field day trying to get people to believe because they're struggling and get weak, and even backslide, and commit presumptuous sin, that they are forever lost, and cannot come back, but God is married to the backslider. There are so many people out there that have failed, and we all have, you know, let's be real, but the Father doesn't want to kick you out of the army of God, he wants to bandage your wounds, he wants to put you back on the firing line. We, we've got too much at stake here to take any of our soldiers and throw them away. We need to minister to them. We need to come back to the Father. We need to get that into that place where the life of Christ flows through us to where we abide in him and we sin not. In the epistle of 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9 and 10, the scripture says here, 
but ye are a chosen generation and a royal priesthood. You see, we are the priest. We are the priest after the order of Melchizedek and holy nation, a peculiar people that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, wasn't that a great scripture? But that's 1 Peter 2, 9 <laughs> instead of 2 Peter 2. I tell you, that's a good, I'll just go ahead and preach on that one. That works too. But let's read 2 Peter 2, 9. And you see, there's one of them uh, errors. How, how'd I do that? You see, that was an error of the old faultiness of our human nature and faculties. But 2 Peter 2, 9, get ready for this one. But he that lacketh these things is blind. Now I'm in First Peter. I'm just having a terrible time here, folks. Oh, my. I'll get in Second Peter 2, 9 here. This must be a good one because I'm having a hard time getting it out. But we're going to get it out here for you. Second Peter 2 and 9. The Lord knoweth how <laughs> to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished, but chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government. Presumptuous are they, self-willed. You see, what big words here. They despise the true government and the authority that God sets in the body of Christ. They are presumptuous. They know they're doing wrong, but they're going to do it anyway. Presumptuous are they self-willed. This is, says it all, doesn't. Five times in Isaiah, Lucifer said, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. Five times. This is the self-will the self-willed presumptuousness of Luciferian religion. And this is what the Father has a problem with. Now, let's look at Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7, and let's look at verses 18 through 22. Now, the text says here, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. It would be real good if we could all figure this out. For to will is present with me. Now, I often ask the question, can Satan make you do something against your will? Oh, yes, he can. There are many people that go out into a bar drinking and they'll get in a fight and they'll take someone's life. They had no intention of doing it and didn't want to do it. But Satan made them do something against their will. We cannot overcome sin by our willpower. We have to die to it by faith in the cross. For I know that in, my, that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good I find not. Now, if that was true for Paul, that's true for us. Now, in Romans 6, 7, and 8, he takes us into uh, Romans chapter 6 is basically the mechanics of salvation. Romans chapter 7 is the failure to serve God under the flesh. And Romans chapter 8 is the victory of the Spirit of God. Now, for the good, verse 19 for the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find in a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. So you see, all of us, there are times when Satan makes us do things against her will. Now, hopefully, it's not great big things, you know, because I mean, uh, there's a difference uh, between calling someone uh, a woolly booger and going out and committing adultery. There's a little difference there, you see. We need to differentiate there. Uh, but we have to understand also that when we are overpowered 
and do things that we really didn't want to do. That There's grace for us. There is grace. There is forgiveness. This is not what we're talking about. And there are people that get into bondages. And here you come into bondages and strongholds and uh, alcohol, drugs, pornography. There's many of them. And this complicates the situation. And we have to have deep repentance, cleansing of iniquity, and in many cases, deliverance for these strongholds to be overcome. But there is grace and deliverance. And when you're, you, you can fall into a sin repent cycle. Now, let's be real here for a minute. How many of you have ever sinned a certain sin, asked forgiveness for it, and then done it again? Huh? We've all done that. Let's be real. And this is a sin repent cycle. And you've got to break that sin repent cycle. And this is only done by dying through sin, by faith in the cross, and allowing the Holy Spirit to give you that abiding in Christ to where you lose that desire to sin. You see, people always do what they want to do. And the Holy Spirit of God can allow us to so abide in Christ that we don't want to sin. We don't want to sin. And he can give us the ability to perform according to that will of our new nature. Now, verse 21, For I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Now, I have great respect for uh, the Puritans, most of whom would be called Reformed in theology. I have great respect. Uh, that would be people like Bunyan, Owen, uh, Sharnock, uh, great men of God with tremendous integrity. I have tremendous respect for the nonconformist Baptists like John Gill, Charles Spurgeon, uh, R.A. Torrey. Uh, I also have tremendous respect for those early Methodists. You call them what you want, Methodist, Arminian, uh, or Wesleyan Arminian, uh, basically those that followed after uh, James Arminius and John Wesley. And they differ on some things, you see. But it, it's not like today. Today, the difference is, well, the dispensationalist comes along and he says, well, now the words of Jesus, they're not for Christians. You know, that's a little bit different. Or we have the Hebrew root movement come along and say, now uh, we've got to add the, uh, the Kabbalah and the oral Torah to the Bible to get truth. And, oh, they deny they do that. But, oh, yeah. You better believe that's just what they're doing. I haven't seen a one of them that doesn't do that. It's just how much they drag in. That's the only question. But I many times I'll come down on the side of John Wesley against the reform position. But this is one time I got to come down with, uh, with the reform people and the Baptist. And th the question is this. In verse 22, For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Now, who is being spoken to there? Is it talking about a Christian, or is it talking about a non-Christian? Now, I have to believe that this is talking about a Christian. And a lot of people say, well, how could the Apostle Paul, that can't be the Apostle Paul, wanting to do good and couldn't do it and having his will overcome. That is absolutely the Apostle Paul. That's you, that's me, that's the Apostle Paul. That is everybody. Now, let's have one final word from John Gill, and we're going to take a break. But this is what he said, you know, and in this text, it says, I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Have you seen many unsaved people delighting after the law of God? The people that say they're born again, they don't delight in the law of God. That is not happening, folks. And Brother Gill said this, this an unregenerate man cannot do. And I have to say, Amen. If you're not born again, you don't delight in the law of God. This an unregenerate man cannot do. 
he doesn't like its commands. They are disagreeable to his corrupt nature. And as it is a threatening, cursing, damning law, it can never be delighted in by him. A big amen to that. We're going to take a break, and we're going to be right back with a lot more on the FOJC Remnant Gathering. We have much to offer here on FOJCRadio.com. Most listeners are familiar with our radio page where we're live on Fridays at 6 p.m. Central Time. And in, it includes our chat room where listeners can fellowship and read the scriptures that I post while Brother David's teaching. If you can't catch us live, we offer our podcast page with the latest audios of our remnant gathering or these same audios are made into videos and now videos on two new video channels at www.brighteon.com that's b-r-i-g-h-t-e-o-n.com it's our new free speech channel and also our videos on underground church f-o-j-c on youtube that's the channel that john set up and you can also find our videos on the Doctrine of Christ series on Jimmy Vision. That's www.jimivision.com. And uh, that Jimmy also has our podcast for our Doctrine of Christ series. Uh, and all you got to do is go to your favorite podcast place and type in the Doctrine of Christ and see what comes up. On our resources page, you can find a list of our books, CDs, DVDs, free Bible studies, and tracts that can be printed or read. Check out our online Bible school or our music page. Both include easy-to-click audio files. You can find the latest news on our ministry news page that also includes a link to our free book. I've tried to include answers to frequently asked questions on our Hot Topics page. We also try to help our listeners find local fellowship in their area with the Remnant Locations page. And for those who struggle with abuse issues, I offer my Ritual Abuse and Healing page. Our contact page has a short order form, some links for your love gifts, and of course our contact information. And most important is our God Wants to Save You page. If you need help in leading someone to the saving mercy and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, there are plenty of uh, things to choose from on that page, including a little prayer that I wrote uh, to help lead people to really accepting the Lord and inviting Him to be their Lord and Savior. It's all there, all free. So please use these many things that we offer on our website. We appreciate your support and have tried to make our site easy to navigate. But if you have a problem finding something, just email me at lastdayschurch at cs.com and I will be happy to help. Blessings to all our listeners and thanks again for your prayers and encouragement. Now back to tonight's message with Brother David Carrico on FOJC Radio. Welcome back to the FOJC Remnant Gathering. And as I always do after the break, I want to sincerely thank each and every one of you that prays for us and that studies with us and that blesses us with all of your gifts and your kindnesses. We thank you so very, very much from the bottom of our heart. We're going to get back to work, and we're going to look at the text in Hebrews 10.27, and I think I'll read verse 26 again to get us the context. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for 
of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries you know and wh what are people thinking you know uh, there are so many people in churches today because they have adopted uh, one form or another of uh, unconditional eternal security doctrines they think they can just sin away and sin away and sin away and they might lose lose a little bit of reward in heaven or something, but, you know, they think it's going to be all good. I mean, what are you thinking, really, that there's not, if you're going to willfully sin and do what you know the Father says you're not supposed to do, you think there's not going to be a big day when that's going to come to a screeching halt? Oh, yeah. And uh, I'll, I'll give us our meditation verse for this week we don't have a memory verse we'll have a meditation verse it comes from deuteronomy 424 and this text is quoted again in the book of hebrews in chapter 12 29 but it says this for the lord thy god is a consuming fire even a jealous god now how great the love of god is and how great the mercy of God already. I have tried to encourage all of our hearts with God's mercy. How that in all of our weaknesses, he lifts down. Not to destroy us or crush us, but to lift us up by his grace and by his mercy. But how much do we also need to hear? For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire just meditate on that we hear so much and rightly so about the love and grace of God we can't talk enough about it but there's such imbalance in the American evangelical church very little is heard about the judgment of God and of God being a consuming fire he is too holy to even look upon sin we must make holiness our objective that we press toward. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. And this is the thing that sets apart these last days as a day, days of apostasy. One of the many we could mention, the fact that holiness is now an option. And this is something to which the, the Puritans and the nonconformist bat Baptist and the Wesleyan Arminians, they all agreed at a point in time, you know, back in the 17 and the 1800s, they all agreed that holiness was not optional. Today, that has gone down the tube with so many. But the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. You see, if you think you can say that Jesus is the truth and run over here and bring in a little new age, we'll bring in a little Gnosticism, we'll bring in a little Kabbalah. You might as well stop telling big porkies saying you think Jesus is the truth because you don't. You think he has to be mixed with other things to get the truth, you see? You, you need to meditate on the fact that our God is a consuming fire and that our God is a jealous God and it's time to get a great big dose of the fear of God and I know there was one of the prayer requests today for people to come out of false teachings and so many people um, it's so true the Lord is our shepherd but they want to drink out of dirty puddles and um, that is so true people need to knock off the nonsense in Isaiah chapter 33 verse 14 the sinners in Zion are afraid, and boy, they need to be. Fearfulness hath surprised the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Who among us can stand when the judgment of God comes? All of your arguments, all of your pretenses, all of your uh, little clever ideas they are going to burn. It is time to seriously make war upon sin and turn back to the real Jesus with all of our 
heart. I want to read something again from John Owen, his commentary on Hebrews, page 536 of volume 6. He said this, I doubt not, but respect is had under the final judgment at the last day and the eternal destruction of apostates. But yet also it evidently includeth that sore and fiery judgment which God was bringing on the obstinate apostate Jews in the total destruction of them and their church state by fire and sword. No wonder the Hebrew root movement hates the book of Hebrews. And this is absolutely the context because Paul was warning people about going back into Judaism. Now, you don't apostatize in 24 hours, but you go back into error little by little. If you're really born again, you just don't turn your back on Jesus overnight. But what happens, you adopt this little bit of leaven, you adopt a little more leaven, and once you start nibbling on air, it just goes down a little easier each time. This is the great warning from the great Apostle Paul here in the book of uh, Hebrews. Knock off the nonsense. In Hebrews 10.28, He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Now, when the law was broken in the covenant of Moses, it wasn't tolerated, you know? And today, in the body of Christ, willful sin should not be tolerated. And today, we we have everywhere people living in willful sin. And again, I'm not talking about people that are struggling. You know, Jesus said um, a bruised reed or smoking flax, um, he would not quench. And he was talking about people that, you know, when a reed is bruised, I remember when I was a little kid, I'd take my, I'd find me a good tree limb that looked like a sword, and I'd shape it up a little bit, and I'd go whacking weeds with it. I was a, I was a human weed whacker. And when you hit one of them weeds, and it'll bend over, but it won't completely sever, that's just what Jesus is talking about. There are people that are wounded, they're bowed over, and just one more little hit would would destroy them. That's not what Jesus is about. There are people that are just like a candle, and the light, all it would take is just a little poof, or a little touch to that, and your flame would go out. Jesus does not want to put your flame out. He wants to bring your flame into a flaming fire that will set you on fire as a firebrand for God. But yet we must warn all, deliberate breaking of the covenant is not acceptable. It wasn't acceptable under the law of Moses, even more so. It is not acceptable in the new covenant. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 13, let's begin in verse 6, and let's just read a little bit. Deuteronomy 13, let's begin in verse 6. If thy brother, the son of thy mother, or thy son, or thy daughter, or the wife of thy bosom, or thy friend, which is as thine own soul, entice thee secretly, saying, Let us go and serve other gods, which thou hast not known, thou nor thy fathers. Now let's just take a breath here for a minute. This is exactly what is happening today, and the Hebrew root movement is the poster child for this. They are lifting up Metatron. They are lifting up Einsof. They are lifting up Barbello. And there is no shame on their faces when they do it. Not only that, but other people will run to them to reinforce them in their error. This is nothing but rank abomination and violation of the covenant. In verse 7... 
namely of the gods of the people which are round about you nigh unto thee, so far off from thee, from the one end of the earth, even unto the other end of the earth. Thou shalt not consent unto him, nor hearken unto him, neither shall thine eye pity him. You see, people that are lifting up other gods, we are forbidden by the word of God to have any pity on them. You see, but yet people that say they obey the Torah, they'll have all kinds of pity upon people that are worshiping other gods. You need to read it again, don't you? Neither shalt thou spare him, neither shalt thou I conceal him. You see, they go along, they get along, they cover up, they ignore blatant idolatry. This is not the word of God, and a great big warning must be given in no uncertain terms. This is dangerous. This is, what can I say? The word of God says it. The word of God is clear. There's not any wiggle room is here. It's wrong to worship other gods, <laughs> you know? And isn't it a strange situation when we have to give this warning to people that supposedly um, obey or supposedly love the, the law of God? This is this is crazy. It's insane. Um, in, in 1 Timothy 5 and 24... The scripture says here, some men's sins are open beforehand, going before to judgment, and some men they follow after. And there are some people, they're judged for what they do right here in this life. The judgment of God falls on them. That's not true with everybody. You know, there are people that I really wonder how in the world, you know, it's a good thing little Davy doesn't run the universe. Well, I don't even want to use that word universe. Doesn't run the, the whole shooting match. Um, <laughs> because I tell you what, I would be sending. I, I tell you what, when they were up there in New York State and they passed their infanticide baby killing law, I would have hit the button and the nukes would be heading for them and I'd have blowed them up right there in their abomination of uh, reveling over killing unborn children. They didn't get judged for it then, but you better believe they will be judged for it. Some men's sins go beforehand, some follow after, but you better believe the judgment of God will follow after them. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 29, of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. Now there's three things here. There's a sin against the person of Christ. And there's a sin against the office of Christ. And there is a sin against the Holy Spirit. Once more, from John Owen, he said this. He is proposed in the gospel was professed by this sort of sinners for a while to be the Son of God, the true Messiah, the Savior of the world. Hereon faith in him and all holy reverence unto him are required. This they now utterly rejected and despised as unto the outward observance of his commands, ordinances, and situations of divine worship, they openly rejected them, betaking themselves unto other modes and rites of divine service. You see, we're talking about people that totally apostatize and renounce Jesus Christ. And remember this, the road to apostasy. There's there's the day every apostate. There's the day that they took that first step toward apostasy. Return. 
100% to the real Jesus, to the real Word of God, and believe the doctrine of Christ, because that is the only doctrine that we have. Going on, John Owen said this about the blood of the covenant. Everything that takes off from a high and glorious esteem of the blood of Christ as the blood of the covenant is a dangerous entrance into apostasy. Such is the pretended sacrifice of the mass with all things of the like nature. Now, the Mass is another thing we could talk about here. The re-sacrificing of Jesus over and over. And the word is clear that he died once. It's the finished work of the cross that we need to preach and proclaim. And also, how much do you despise the blood of the covenant when you do and Roman Catholicism does this, and also the Hebrew root. Many of them there do also. They'll teach their two-house twists. They'll teach their dual covenant theology. Now, what are you doing when you say that you can be saved by the blood of an animal just as much as you're saved by the blood of Jesus? That is nothing but an insult to the blood of of the covenant if you have any spiritual life in you or ever have had you need to repent because you're in very very dangerous ground Adam Clark in his commentary and his comment on this he takes it a little deeper he says this the blood of the covenant an unholy thing the blood of the covenant means here the sacrificial death of Christ by which the new covenant between God and man was ratified, sealed, and confirmed, and counting this unholy or common intimates that they expected nothing from it in a sacrificial or atoning way. How near to those persons and how near to their destruction do they come in the present day who reject the atoning blood and say that they expect no more benefit from the blood of Christ than they do from that of a cow or sheep. You can sin against the blood of the covenant by totally renouncing it and relying on some other way of salvation. Or you can do despite under the blood of the covenant by saying that you can be saved by the blood of a bull, just as well as you can through Jesus Christ. When Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man cometh unto the Father but by me, he meant just what he says. In the book of Acts, in 4.12, when it says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name in heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It means just that. And when you begin to proclaim that you can come by the way of Jesus, and oh yeah, you can come another way too, this is blaspheming the blood of the covenant. If you are capable of it, you need to repent and you need to repent very, very quickly. In the book of Hebrews, in chapter 9 and verse 15, and for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal in inheritance. Oh yeah. Now, in Matthew in Matthew chapter 26 we'll read the verse 27 and 28 and the text says here, and he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink ye all of it for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. 
it is all about Jesus. It's all about the blood. Jesus was the Lamb of God that took away the sin of the world. And there are people, and here again, this is something, and it's taught, you know, the Hebrew rooters think they made it up. It come from Catholicism. The Catholicism before them taught, and of course, we could we could take it back many, many years, this heresy. It's, it's been around. But Catholicism, I could read you right in the catechism how that uh, Muslims are saved. And, uh, you know, it, it's just salvation without Jesus. That's just what it is. Let's read another text here. Hebrews chapter 8. And let's read verses 7 through 13. And I think I'm going to have to wind it down here. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 7 through 13. And the text says here. Hebrews 8. Beginning in verse 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there should have been there sh then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. I have listened to teachings of people, if I would say their names, many of you would recognize them, in the Hebrew root movement that say, and this is common fare, that the first covenant never ended. It just caught kept going and this is what we call dual covenant theology and if that be true which it's a lie well you can come in either way you want and boy that's a big lie and the same way they say now the new the first covenant didn't end but in the word of God and this is why they hate the book of Hebrews when the new covenant came in with the blood of Jesus the holy lamb of God there was no way to come in to the father through that first covenant anymore. And people that were saved under the old covenant, they were saved by looking forward in faith to the Messiah that would come. And this is just this is just so dangerous. I, I don't have words strong enough to emphasize it to you. In verse 8, For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for, it sh for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. In that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Just re want to read a couple more things. Um, one from John Wesley and one from John Owen, and we're going to wrap this up. Uh, John Wesley commented on this verse. He said, now that which is antiquated is ready to vanish away as it did quickly when the temple was destroyed. And after that, you know, this was the Father's big statement on it all, wasn't it? When he, with the judgment of God, and Jesus prophesied it, didn't he? He prophesied that that temple was going to be destroyed, and it was. And uh, it's amazing to me how people want to try to draw life out of dead men's bones. And um, and I have a one here. Um, I 
And I tell you what, I'll just have a word here, a moment of rare transparency and brutal honesty. I've had so many bookmarks in my John Owen commentary here that I think it fell out. So, <laughs> But basically, John Owen said the same thing as John Wesley did. He said that uh, this was nothing but the absolute statement of the Father in the judgment of the Jews on their sacrificial system where they were trying to continue to bring people to salvation through their animal sacrifices and Levitical ritual. All right. Well, I think we're going to wrap it up here. And um, I just, again, I want to thank each and every one of you for studying with us. And uh, the Word of God is really... Um, pretty clear. We just really need to read the Word of God on our knees and get a good, healthy dose of the fear of God, and we're going to be just fine. All right, tomorrow night, I'll be in the studio with John, and uh, we will be doing the Midnight Ride, which is one of the highlights of my week, every week. Uh, Jimmy Vision Season 3 is airing on Jimmy Vision YouTube channel. Remember our Brideon channel. Uh, this teaching will be up on Brideon very soon, uh, later this evening. Uh, it'll be uploaded to our Underground Church channel in a few days. It'll be up first on Brideon and then on the Underground Church um, YouTube channel. And here again, I want to get people oriented to going to the Brideon channel because we will be able to stick around longer on Brideon than we will on YouTube, I guarantee you. So I'm always uh, zealous to be able to push that. We're the poster child for that, aren't we? Uh, but anyway, God bless you all. Let's just close out in a word of prayer. Father, we just thank you that you're such a loving God. And you're such a merciful God. And Father, we also thank you that you're a holy God. And Father, you told us to be holy like you were. So Father, this is our heart's desire through all of our weakness and our struggles to live in that way that's pleasing unto you. And Father, we know that through abiding in you and your spirit, we can do that. So, Father, lift up the feeble knees and encourage the faint-hearted and let the, let the self-will be warned that you are a consuming fire. So, Father, we just pray that this word go forth and we know it won't go forth void, but just accomplish that which you will. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray and we agree. Amen and amen. God bless you all, and we will see you next Friday night, 6 p.m. Central, on the FOJC Remnant Gathering. Thank you for being a part of our Friday night FOJC Remnant Gathering. You can contact us at FOJC. Post Office Box 4174, Evansville, Indiana, 47724-4174. Or you can check our website out at www.fojcradio.com. Or you can email us at lastdayschurch at cs.com. Or you could call us at 812-473-3735. Thanks and God bless.